Collingwood, just north of Toronto, uh, for three days with my oldest son, Isaac. And Isaac wanted to go uh, mountain biking. Um, Isaac is our child that, that likes extreme sports. He likes pushing the envelope, and he likes dragging his dad along in the midst of it all. And so we went up to Collingwood, and we had three days together. And the first, the first day and the third day was kind of reasonable. Uh, because we did single track, we did, we did cross country, so we're riding the trails over roots, over rocks. But there's the second day, which I have to admit I was a little worried about, because the second day was when Isaac wanted to go downhill mountain biking. Now, if you're not aware of this concept, you go to ski hills when there's no snow in the summertime, and you ride a chairlift up, you get these amazing modified bikes, like entry level are $4,000, shock systems throughout the roof, and you put on this body armor and a helmet, which immediately registers to me, not a good idea. If I have to ride a bike with body armor, I think I might be out. But not wanting to look completely terrified next to my son, uh, we decided to go for it. We have a couple pictures here. I think we have one of Isaac up there. See, there's the bike, there's the armor, there it is all. Um, I was cowering in the corner somewhere in this other picture. And so we're going up, and you ride the chairlift to the top. And the idea is, if you've ever been downhill skiing, there's, there's runs you go down. Well, you run across these, these hills, through the trees, over rocks, over jumps, across bridges, without trying to break your neck. Let me say this. If you're struggling with developing a prayer life, let me introduce downhill mountain biking to you. This is us going up the chairlift, um, after the third or fourth run, so I've kind of got my sensibilities uh, about it. But, but we, we, we had a great time, and Isaac was smart enough, see the wisdom of the 13-year-old, saying, hey, Dad, why don't we get a lesson? And I'm like, that's a good idea. That's a good, let's get a lesson. And so on our way up, on the first ride up, I turn to our instructor, and I say, hey, so, um, simple question, is this a dangerous sport? And his first response is, well, I don't want to scare you. And my thought is, well, don't lead with that line then. That is terrible. He goes, but there's an ambulance here at least once a day. You want to make sure you're not in it. And I'm like, this is not going well. Well, needless to say, I'm here standing before you. Isaac is here somewhere. I'm convinced of it. So no injuries. My goal today was not to be rushed to the eMERGE. But it was a ton of fun, a little bit of scared, okay, a lot of scared, a little bit of uncertainty, and a lot of cranking on the brakes as we went down the hill. And I was thinking about that this past week because I realized that it kind of ties into life in general. And more specifically, how do we live out our faith in all of life? This morning, we're starting a new series, which is called Lived Out. The idea of how do we find faith in the midst of all of life. And I think one of the challenges that, that we face is that faith may become more something we believe in, something that we can speak about, but it fails to begin to impact our life. You see, I realized that day mountain biking with Isaac, that I could buy the bike, or I could rent the bike, I could put on the gear, I could watch all the YouTube videos I wanted, I could even show up to the base of the hill and watch other people go down the hill. But I wasn't mountain biking until I took that step, or more like plunge, and turned my wheel downhill and started to do it myself. This series, I hope, becomes a series that gets us off the chairlift and gets us down the hill. So that faith becomes more than simply the place we show up to, the, the songs we sing, the, the thoughts we may have, and faith becomes more and more about the reality that we live. And the amazing thing about this is that we can jump in at any stage we are in life and in faith. For, for some of you here this morning, you, you've been a follower of Jesus for perhaps a long time. But, but there's always a next step. There's always a next place where God is going to be nudging you and encouraging you to say, will you join me in this? Uh, perhaps for others, you're, you're relatively new to following Jesus. That This has been a relatively new step for you. 
and, and you're kind of like me. Uh, you've kind of gone down the hill a little bit, and you're not really sure. But Jesus is encouraging us to continue to take those steps of faith, to continue to see the opportunities that he begins to lay out before you and me. And then maybe there's some of you here this morning that you've yet to take that step, that you've kind of checked out Christianity, you've, you've, you've come to church a little bit, you, you maybe have even read the Bible, but, but it's not a reality for you yet. I hope that this series is an opportunity for you to begin to see that Jesus can become someone more than just a person we talk about, more than just a person we sing songs about. He can become a reality in your life, not just on Sundays, not just in those moments of crisis, but in the everyday living of life. And so we hope you join us. I know summertime draws us different places, but it's a series where we are going to be searching for faith so that faith is lived out. And to help us with this, we're going to turn to different places in the Bible and look at different examples of different individuals where they took steps of faith, where they began to live out their faith, and then come back and and hopefully get hyper-practical about it and begin asking, wherever I am in the midst of life, in a good season, in, in in a lousy season, in a season of uncertainty, whatever it may be, how can this become a reality for us? Because that's what Jesus wants for us. I just really appreciated the song that Shailene sung, that no matter where you are, No matter where you are, Jesus wants to meet you there and invite you into a life fully lived with him. I don't know about you, but sometimes one of the challenges when we hear about faith, when we talk about reading the Bible, we we think of some of the heavyweights of faith. Uh, we, We think of some of the individuals who did some incredibly great things for God. Uh, We think of Joseph, or we think of Moses, Uh, We think of some of the apostles, we think of Paul, and we think, I I can't live up to that. And so we're not going to touch on some of the the bigger names in the Bible. We're going to turn to some of the less well-known ones. And we're going to turn to a guy in the book of Exodus, Exodus 17. I, I don't want you to turn there. Maybe you can read it later on this week. But it's a guy by the name of Her, three letters, H U R. Not sure if any of you have, uh, have, have heard of him uh, before, but he's an interesting character. And I think one of the great things, one of the things that, that allows me to see the Bible really come to life is not when I simply read it, but I, I try to begin to get myself into the story as well. I begin to allow it to become simply more than just words or information that, is, that I'm reading through, but it becomes a reality that I experience. And sometimes it's easier to do it than others. And I want us to do a little bit of an exercise that is likely going to make some of you uncomfortable. Others, you're going to kind of jump right in on this. But just during this story, starting now, if you just want to raise your arms, just raise your arms. I know some of the charismatics and Pentecostals are like, thank you, Jesus. Finally, we can raise our arms in a Presbyterian church, eh? The day will come. Others are like, wait a second here. This is, this is a little uncomfortable, right? So, but keep those arms up if you're comfortable, if you're able to kind of hold it there because I think it's going to help you remember this story a little bit more. Okay? Keep them up. Don't, don't let them drop. Keep them up. So it goes all the way back. Exodus 17, it's a time in Israel's history where you may remember God created a nation called Israel. And they were his people. Well, they got into some hard times, and the hard times was 400 years of slavery in Egypt. And after 400 years, they're crying out to God, they're complaining to God, they're wondering, God, where are you in the midst of this? And God sends a guy named Moses to deliver them. And you may remember that Moses had kind of a head-to-head with Pharaoh, you know, the the ten plagues, Moses let them go, but then, or sorry, Pharaoh let them go, but then Moses chased them. Arms getting tired. Keep them up, people. Come on. Keep them up. Pharaoh chased them, and then Moses, through God with his staff, he planted it in the Red Sea. The Red Sea parted. They went through the Red Sea. They continued on and on and on. This goes on for 40 years because they were waiting on the promise where God says, not only am I going to take you out of something, I'm going to bring you into the promised land, this land of Canaan. But 40 years. And anyone who knows when you are, you're going tripping and you're, you're going across land, you're going into other people's territory. Right? Now, not everyone likes unknown people in their backyard. 
right? Think about it for a moment. If you walked out your backyard and suddenly you noticed strangers walking through your backyard, you'd probably be like, hey, what the heck is going on? What are you doing here? Well, there's a million Israelites. Keep those hands up, people. You're, you're slacking here. Come on, right? A million people are wandering through the desert. And the people who own the land don't like that. And so what you read is there's various battles along. I'm trying to speak quicker to get us to the point. Don't worry. I feel the pain. I feel the pain. Right? Other, other nations don't like this. And there's one particular nation called the Amicalites who don't like it at all. But they don't actually own land. They're kind of nomadic. And the way that they survive is they would kind of jump in, attack a country, take a little bit of what they have, and then retreat. So they would attack and retreat, attack and retreat. Well, you get a million people wandering through the wilderness, they are easy target. And so part of the history was the Amicalites keep coming and attacking the nation of Israel, kind of taking the things that are theirs. And it comes to a point where God says, enough enough and he summons Moses and Joshua and says you are going to go to battle with them and so Joshua leads the nation into battle which isn't such a good idea because Israel was not well equipped they, they, they were not good at fighting these types of battles they, they were oftentimes complainers grumblers always looking back and yet Joshua is to lead them here comes the part of the story you'll never forget and you're going to love. He tells Moses, go up on the hillside and with the staff of God, hold your arms up. And here's the deal. Here's the deal. Here's the important part. Here's why you got to keep our arms up. As long as your arms are held up, Israel will win. As soon as your arms begin to drop, Israel will lose. Now, you've all had your arms up for about three and a half minutes. Imagine an entire day with the outcome of your nation dependent upon if you can keep your arms up. So we're going to go for about another hour and a half. <laughs> because if I ever go into battle, I want to know who I can bring with me, right? Well, Moses gets tired. And so they first bring him a stone that he can sit on. And then his arms begin to drop, and so they call two people. They call Aaron and our good buddy. A little more enthusiasm. Those arms are going to be up a little bit longer. Aaron and our good buddy. Her. And they come, and they literally hold the arms of Moses up, and Israel wins the battle. Put your arms down. Wait till next week. You got to come next week. <laughs> this is going to be like faith lived out and, and calisthenics with Joel every Sunday, right? We're going to whip you into shape here. But here's an interesting guy. Because I think there's lots for us to take from the example of her. When I think of the words of James where he says, you know, faith without works is dead. When he talks about how do we live out our faith in a day-to-day -day reality, I think her can teach us a number of things. The first one is this, that oftentimes God wants to use you right where you are. I think there's this misunderstanding that, that we have to go away. Maybe we have to go overseas or, or we have to go to a new place. And sometimes we start to play this, 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 this mind game with ourselves and we we kind of think we're bringing God along in it, but we think, well, if, if God, if I was just living here, or if this circumstance would have just changed, then I could do this. I think the example of her is often, where are you right now? What is your circle of influence? What, what is your community that you live in, and how can God live you right, use you right now? The second one is, the example of her is, Oftentimes, small is big. That oftentimes, it's the small steps of faith that begin to have a big difference. If you go back and read this, it's in Exodus chapter 17. The whole battle is not described what Joshua and the others are doing. It's all about Moses and her and Aaron 
up on the mountainside, just trying to keep Moses' hands raised. I don't think it would have been too glamorous for her to be holding on to Moses' arm. You know, when you, when you think of accomplishing great things, that probably would not have been near the top of the list. But it was significant. And I think at times we may fail to live out our faith because we may be looking for the big deal, the big opportunity. And God is saying, can you be faithful in the small things? Can you look for the ways that I am going to nudge you and and encourage you to, to step out in faith and not only obey me, but to also follow me? But I think the greatest lesson we learn from the example of her, and I think the most important thing as to why God wants us to live out our faith, it's not simply because of what we can accomplish. You know, oftentimes we may think, well, I need to to serve, I I need to give, I I need to volunteer, I, I I need to help, I need to forgive, I need to do all these things because it's gonna benefit someone else, and that is so true. But I think the greatest reality of why God wants us to live out our faith, because of the difference it makes in our lives. If you turn back to the passage in James, just listen to what James says. He says, don't merely listen to the word and so deceive yourself. Do what it says. Now, James is super practical. If if you read the book of James, he's very practical. Do this, do this, don't do that, don't do that. But but listen to the context of everything he's saying. He's not disputing the fact that when you live out your faith, it'll impact others. But listen to what he highlights. He says, because the one who looks intently into God's law that gives freedom and continues to do this not forgetting what he has heard, but doing it, right? We, we get that, that, that faith is not about just simply what we hear and what we believe, it's what we do. James then, James then wraps it up with this. He says, they will be blessed in what they do. Do you notice that? James doesn't say, if you serve others, if you help others, if you step out in faith, then others will be blessed which is true. The emphasis is upon when you step out and live out your faith, it will impact you. And that's the amazing thing about the Bible. You you read stories like her and Aaron and Moses. You see the example of Jesus with his disciples. And constantly you see this pattern beginning to develop that whenever God wants to do something, he invites others to join him. Like, did God need her in this story? Did God need Moses in this story? No. But God values partnership. Because it's often in partnering with God that we begin to deepen our relationship with him. You see, Christianity is not a religion to be learned. It's a relationship to be lived. And that relationship begins to develop through shared experiences. The highlight for me in going mountain biking with Isaac was not just simply the accomplishment of going down the hill, not just simply the, uh, the pictures that I can now post to Facebook and say, hey, look what I've done. It's not just the experience of not having had to be rushed to a hospital. It was that shared experience with Isaac. Because you know what happened the rest of the night when we were together? Is we would go back and we would relive the times going down the hill. The good, the bad, the embarrassing, the ones I wish Isaac would not repeat in public. <laughs> like we'd sit there at dinner time and say, hey dad, do you remember that time when you took a wrong turn and you got lost and the search team had to go looking for you? Yeah, yeah, I remember that time, Isaac. Thank you very much. Or do you remember that time when I cut the corner perfectly and you missed the corner and you went over your handlebars and landed in the rhubarb? Yeah, yeah, true story there too. 
Or do you remember the time when you were going down and you were so scared that you were screaming like a little ninny? <laughs> yeah, again, that was me. But shared experiences. And we'll be able to go back to that. And we'll be able to reflect upon that. And I'm sure you have that in your life as well with other people. That experiences become so great when you do it with others. And you can relive those moments. God wants us to step out in faith, not just simply to accomplish great things for him, but for him to do tremendous things in you and me as well. So that we can begin to have those shared experiences. And what I begin to notice in my life it's those shared experiences. It's those moments of remembering and recognizing when God did some incredible things, when God showed up when I needed him most, that enables me to take that next step of faith. God wants us to live out our faith, not just simply because of the great things we can accomplish, but because of the impact that it has upon us. That's why, that's why James says over and over, you know, faith without works is dead. It's just having a knowledge of God. It's not living. It's just existing. And Jesus says you could have so much more. A pastor in uh, Barry, Kerry Newhoff, says, uh, the problem is many Christians are 500 Bible verses overweight. We ingest and we ingest and we ingest, but we fail to live out, live out, live out. And so what's your next step? Because I think faith lived out can impact us in two ways. One is in recognizing and holding to the promises of God. That, that too often we may sing of the promises of God, we, we may sing of the love of God, but have we truly received that in our lives? You see, God wants us to live out our faith because God is a God of action. That God does not simply talk about love. He shows his love. I was sitting around a campfire a couple of weeks ago with, uh, with someone, and we were, we were chatting about faith and about religion. And he said, Joel, why do you follow Jesus? Of all the religions out there, of, of, of everything else you can believe in, why do you believe in Jesus? And my response was simply because I think that everyone is searching for love. And the greatest display of love is seen in Jesus. His life, his death, his resurrection. That's the greatest example of love. And that's why I choose to follow Jesus. Because he is not one who simply talks about it. He shows it in how he lived and how he died and then how he rose again. And that's a love that is available to all of us. And so maybe the step for some of you here this morning is, is simply living out that reality of faith. Not just simply allowing it to be a knowledge, but allow it to become a reality in your life. For others, Maybe God is nudging you. Others might say leading you. Others might say pushing you. Other, whatever terminology you might want to use. What is God putting upon your heart? What has God laid before you? Maybe it's a step of faith to actually begin the process of forgiveness. Maybe it's a step of faith where it is actually to increase your giving. I mean, maybe it's a step of faith where, where you begin to have conversations with your neighbors or, or, or with your family members uh, about your faith. Maybe it's an opportunity to serve here in the church. I don't know what it is because God is going to be original with all of you. But I do know this. God is going to nudge you. And so you have a choice. You can buy all the gear. You can show up to the right place. You can even watch other people live out their faith. But that's not living life with Jesus. It's taking those steps of faith and making it a part of your reality in your life as well. And so one takeaway for all of us this morning, I know this will probably mess up our camera, but I'm going to make an assumption that all of you every day will take a look into one of these at some point. 
fair assumption to make. Maybe in the morning, maybe at night, you brush your teeth, you wash your face, you put on makeup, you shave, whatever it's going to be. Can you use that this week as a trigger to simply offer a simple prayer? And the prayer is this. God, make me aware of your nudging. Because James says when you look into the mirror and forget what you look like, it's the same as hearing from God and not acting. And so when you look into the mirror, simply pray, God, make me aware of your nudging and grant me the courage to step out in faith. Because when you live out your faith, it will impact your life. So that God is not simply someone you speak about. He becomes a reality in all of life. Let's pray together. And so Jesus.